Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 12th of October. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, interest rates growing into a Category 5 storm and more evidence that Australian bank deposits can be bailed in. Have you read the terms and conditions of your bank account? Um, so Craig, Today, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Um, as usual, though, uh, just to, before we get into it, I want to remind viewers that what we discuss today is part of the mobilisation that we're on, not just to provide information, but to do something about yeah. it. And yep. if people want to get involved, they can call in and get a copy of the Australian Alert Service, which the information that we have is backed up in, right? And we really urge people to do that. I also want to remind viewers that it's the... Uh, the, we're still encouraging people to make submissions to the Royal Commission, right? There's a, the, the interim report is uh, seeking submissions and those submissions close on the 26th of October. The deadline's the 26th of October. So if you haven't made a submission yet, make one. And we're encouraged to make a submission to say to the Royal Commissioner, what you've got to do is recommend breaking up the banks, right? Yep. And we're going to go through details, of, again, more evidence now as to why that's absolutely necessary. Definitely. So, first, interest rates growing into a Category 5 storm. Today is the 10th anniversary of not the start of the global financial crisis, but a very crucial event in Australia that was part of the global financial crisis. It's when there was a weekend meeting, Craig, between Kevin Rudd and his main ministers like Julie Gillard and Wayne Swan and... Uh, um, the finance minister at the time, Lindsay Tanner, yeah, I was gonna say. and the banks. Mm -hmm. And the banks were on their knees. They were begging for guarantees 10 years ago today. They said to the government, if you don't give us guarantees, we're going to be insolvent sooner rather than later. And Kevin Rudd, that's, that's when he announced the, I call them the three, three guarantees, he called them two guarantees. One guarantee was on um, bank deposits, supposedly. One guarantee is he allowed that this was the main part, point of the guarantee. The banks were allowed to borrow overseas to roll over their existing debt, which otherwise they couldn't pay. They were allowed to borrow on the government's credit rating. Mm, triple right? A. So we taxpayers allowed the banks, we backed up their borrowing from overseas. And this was they had $440 billion in 90 day debt, 50 billion had been called in, they couldn't pay it. Mm. And they were saying to the government, we're goners, right? And the government stepped in with those guarantees. Now, why, one of, and the third guarantee, quickly, is they triple the first homeowner's grant, and I call that the guarantee on house prices. Yes. <laughs> because what's happened since, they'd started to go down, and since then the prices have soared again, and to the point where they've reached totally unaffordable levels, and now they're starting to go down again. Um, but without, those, without that intervention by the government, our banking system would have been just as smashed as the United States, except we weren't being told that at the time. No, no, completely different, Robbie. It was... It was assurances upon assurances upon assurances upon assurances. Our and banks everyone are else sound, was going we broke. Told. Our banks were sound, everything. And people can remember this. Yep. Right? The problem is they weren't. No, that's right. And now is, now's the time to give people a sense of that. Well, and people need to bear that in mind because we're going to be talking about things in a minute where you, you, gotta, you, you cannot trust what your government's going to tell you on this. When I say your government, I mean this government. Yes. Right? These governments. They are too much in the in the tank of the banks, and you cannot trust them because there's all these signs that we're in facing another crisis now. So let's just go into that for this segment, and then in the next segment we're going to deal specifically with what the government's prepared to do to keep the banks propped up at our expense, called bailout. Um, so think about the decade since that the, the the GFC, the global financial crisis. At the time, the, it was called. People call it different things. Australia is the only country that adopted this acronym, the GFC, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some people call it the Great Recession, whatever. In general, though, at the time, it was being called a debt crisis because it was a debt crisis. Mm -hmm. You had all this debt that was unpayable, actually, mm -hmm. right? And it all came home to the roost because the debt had been built up on the back of speculation. Well, let's look at what's happened since then. Has the debt crisis gone away? No. So just to give you a sense of it, in global debt in the year 2000, was 84 trillion US dollars. That's, that's eight years before the crash, or around the, just, just at the point they repealed the Glass-Steagall Act in America. So two th 84 trillion dollars. By the time of the crash in 2008, global debt was 173 trillion. 
And you've got to put that in perspective. It had taken all of human history to build up global debt to 84 trillion to, to, to the year 2000. And then it had more than doubled um, in eight, in eight years. years. Yep. Right? 173 trillion. So then we had a debt crisis and everyone recognised this is a debt crisis. Did we solve the debt crisis? No, today, global debt is $250 trillion, right? So this is, and, and, and so that's global debt. Let's look at Australia's contribution to that debt. Our government debt has gone from being a, a nominal surplus back in, in uh, 2008 to now a $500 billion federal government debt. Total foreign debt of Australia is over $2 trillion dollars. Um, our net foreign debt is over one trillion dollars. Net means what when you take off what other countries owe to us, and that's this is like I think around two thousand eight was about um, maybe uh, uh, six hundred billion, right? So it's it's completely soared. Um, household debt is one hundred and ninety percent of annual income, and that's from up around uh, up from about one hundred and sixty percent in two thousand eight. So it's just steadily gone up and up and up. That's nearly a global record, one hundred and ninety percent. It's funny, Craig, economists have said as our household debt's gone up, oh, it doesn't matter, the household debt of Australians, because it's offset by the assets they hold. And those assets <laughs> are... A, a cr houses. Houses. Uh, crashing. <laughs> well, that's the thing. The, the house prices are crashing. Is the debt going down? No. No. Well, right? the credit card debt's not going down either, Robbie. No, that's we, right. So, look, the, the, the interesting thing here is this brings up an aspect that we're going to be discussing in future weeks, the question of actually a debt moratorium. Yeah, yeah. Now, because, look... There's no way that a lot of this debt is payable. A lot of the households, you know, we've got 300,000 people in mortgage crisis here in Victoria, yeah, yeah. right? It's about a million across the country. How are you going to solve that? More of the same? More of the same policies? Like, no, that's just going to drive people into bankruptcy, completely crash the housing market because you can have so many houses coming on the market on top of what's already, you know, uh, you know coming on the market in terms of these overbuilt uh, apartments. So the issue becomes you have to look at a different policy. Yeah, that yeah. policy is debt moratorium. So this well, we've put out a five point, we issued a five point program, yeah. which includes a, a moratorium to get that, some of the, especially the household debt will have to just be written off. Well, that's the point. And this is what, we're moving this on, on, a, down, on, on, a, on a global system as well. There's a lot of debt globally, it just has to be written yeah. off. There has to be, a, there will be a massive adjustment. The question is, do you have a global depression and the risk of war, because often depressions and war go in hand in hand, or do we have a, an orderly, an orderly way, yeah. like around a conference, like a New Bretton Woods conference, like they had in America in 1944, where the countries of the world get together and say, what do we do about this? So you've, you've raised a very important point. Let me give you more predicates now about why it's even more important, because this debt that's built up, this is at record low interest rates, and it's built up on the back of all this quantitative easing for the last 10 years, something like $14 trillion, right? That's where the Federal Reserve... In printed money. ...printed money and stuff put yeah, into the economy. Yeah, exactly. And it's barely serviceable at these record low interest rates. And that's the point of this discussion now, because what we're seeing right now is interest rates going up. So look at just the last week or so. On the um, 4th of October, there was a sudden sell-off of US Treasury bonds, Craig, mm -hmm. and the US 10-year bond rate soared in one day from 3.1, less than 3.1%, 3.0 something percent, to more than three and a quarter percent. For one day, that, that was a very sharp rise. And you can see a, a chart on the screen where you can see how it's bumping along and suddenly goes up. This shocked a lot of people because what that, and it, it actually went up on the expectations of more interest rate rises by the US Federal Reserve, but it shows you that this is, this is sort of a metric for the global financial system. Interest rates are not going down, they're going up. Mm -hmm. So even if our, Fed, our Reserve Bank keeps our interest rates on hold, 40% of what our banks um, uh, lend, they borrow from overseas, these overseas interest rate rises are going to be translated into Australia as well. And right? the private banks are in lifting interest rates outside of anything the Reserve That's Bank right. is doing, which That's is right. you know, completely breaking from any sort of tradition of the past. No, and so there, you, you know, if you're a homeowner watching this and you're trying to service your mortgage, you know what interest rate rises mean to you at the moment. Everyone in Australia is terrified of them, right? A lot of people are going to be pushed over the edge by not too much in the way of interest rate rises. You're not the only debt category in trouble. One other one that's worth mentioning is US corporate debt by the debt that's been borrowed by big corporations in America. It's $13 trillion. And look what's happened yesterday and today, Craig, a week after this interest rate event in America, 
you're now seeing big slides in the US stock market. And there was a lot of, we've had some inside, inf like uh, people briefing us this morning from the United States saying there's sort of a lot of consternation about where's this coming from? Well, part of it is that level of the US stock market has been driven by these corporations borrowing money to buy back their own stocks. Borrowing the quantitative easing money, Robbie, from yeah, yeah. the Federal Reserve and so forth. If interest rates go up, yep. Right. They cannot afford that. And no. so you're seeing the effect of the, of the, um, on the stock market as well. So this is what people might think we're coming into a new crisis, Craig. I would argue, I'd like to see what you think, that what we're, this is the continuation of the crisis that erupted in 2000. Look, the policy metrics from our government has not changed, Robbie. The underlying issue here is that the financial system is built upon speculation. Right? It's allowed the private banking system through the takedown of Glass-Steagall globally but here in Australia as well to take you know what should be protected deposits and speculate with them and you also had a, have had a policy of not directing credit by governments into productive activities all the credit has been pushed into first homeowner schemes and stuff increasing the amount of money to, for yep, people to yep. buy homes and stuff which they can't afford so what you're seeing now is the end phase of those policies and it's not some 10-year policy or even five-year policy, this is a 30 to 40-year-old policy. And most people, young people under the age of 30, wouldn't have a clue of what the alternatives would be. Well, we did a headline of our alert service a few weeks ago was, has the can that was kicked down the road in 2008 stopped in 2018? And you might be seeing that now. Well, I think so this goes back to 1998, actually, probably even before 1980. Well, that's right. They've been kicking, they've They're been creating kicking, bubbles yeah, to no. kick the can down the road for a long it's time. It's a pretty beat-up can. <laughs> that's, tr that's true. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, important new evidence about bail-in. Welcome back to the CEC Report. More evidence that Australian bank deposits can be bailed in. Have you read the terms and conditions of your bank account? Now, Craig, one of the reasons we talked so much in the previous segment about the reality of a crash now is to bring home that what we're about to discuss is not academic. Bail-in is a real threat. It's not just something they talk about in the airy fairy. So what's happened is I want to play a video where economist John Adams and digital finance analytics Martin North in their regular show, they have uncovered important new evidence about bail-in. Now, we... We already knew bail-in affected deposits, right, for, for sure. And it was based, our reasoning was based on the fact that everywhere else in the world that's got it, it applies to deposits. Um, the, we know that the, that the people setting them up have, have been caught lying and proven to be liars and when they've said it hasn't applied to deposits. So look, and, and the other one was the, the law that was passed in February, the APRA bail-in law, said, had these very broad words, any other instruments, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, some people didn't think that was proof, though. John Adams has watched John Adams talk about the, what they've discovered now on the back of that. Now, there is another provision in that broad section of the legislation that this advisor said we should be looking at. And so that is uh, CAB. And basically, you know, uh, we'll put it up on screen for viewers to have a read. But basically, what that section says is for an instrument to be bailed in, it has to have terms expressly defined to say that the instrument can be bailed in. So for example, when an investor invests, invests in a hybrid security, as part of the prospectus, there are terms in the prospectus that makes it clear that the capital invested in that security could be converted into equity um, if the bank requires it to do so. So what this advisor said to me was that because of this particular legislation, because of this particular provision, they did not think that deposits were at risk because, um, because, because they thought that only investment products have these specific provisions of conversion, uh, 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 conversion and write-off. Now, when this was said to me, the first question I asked the advisor was, did you look at the contract, the terms and conditions, of what a deposit, uh, what a depositor has with a bank. Um, so, so basically, uh, for, for 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 any of you who are watching this episode, if you go to a bank, you basically fill out a, like a two or three forms to establish an account with a bank, uh, and 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 the, the bank, uh, because of what they are required to do, they'll provide you with with a big document full of terms and conditions, 
and that term, terms, terms and conditions are effectively the contract between you and the bank. So said to the advisor, did you check the terms and conditions of the deposit accounts uh, with the various uh, uh, like banks and credit unions, etc.? The answer was no. So, 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 so that, that was the first issue. Now, now the, so, so, so exploring that for a second is, so the, because they didn't check the uh, contract, the terms and conditions, the first question is, is that, is there any existing terms or conditions, oh, sorry, is there any bail-in or conversion or write-off provisions in these terms and conditions uh, for these de de deposit accounts. Now, uh, I did a bit of a search, and I know you did a bit of a search, so I think it's fair to say that at the moment, I couldn't, particularly with the big four banks, I couldn't find any explicit reference to, 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 to defining a deposit as an instrument that can be converted or bailed in. Is, 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 is that I, fair? I agree, and I've looked at some of the smaller players as well, and there is no specific clause that says deposits can be bailed in. However, yes, it's a little bit, but there is this wonderful catch-all clause, which pretty much all of the contracts have. That's right. Which is like the size of a huge, huge double-deckered bus, right? Which basically says they can change anything they want, anytime they want. Yes. And even potentially make it retrospective. Yes. And more importantly, they do not have to give the customer advance notice. Yep. So, so particularly, and, and we'll go through what the big four, uh, what the terms and conditions are for the for the big four banks. But, but particularly if the change is at the request of the regulator or government, the 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 they do not have to give advance notice to customers. Um, and, and in some cases, all they really have to do is to put a notice in a major newspaper. Yep. Um, so, 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 yeah. So, so because of that, so I think, I think the what to be as accurate as possible. The state of play, given this uh, uh, section eleven CAB, is that for an instrument to be bailed in, the, ter the, the 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 terms and conditions, or the contract, or the prospectus of the instrument, has to explicitly say this instrument can be converted or written off. Um, like a, you know, uh, where, when the circumstances allowed, or if APRA provides a recapitalization directive uh, that we talked about in the last episode. Uh, so, so, so there's nothing there at the moment. But if the banks get into trouble uh, because of these clauses that we're about to go through with, with, in terms of the big four, they can change the deposit contracts at any moment without any due notice, without any forewarning of uh, 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 in, t in terms of these deposit accounts, and then. So, so, so what, it would, what it would be is the, the, the banks would, if they needed to bail in to, to, to ensure that the banks would survive, they would basically say that this deposit account has conversion or write-off uh, power or like properties. And then once those are then in the contract, in, you know, it could have happened in the middle of the night, APRA could then issue a recapitalization directive and saying everything that has uh, any instrument that has these provisions, you can then bail in. And because the bank has snuck them in, uh, without customers knowing, um, therefore it will be legal under the legislation. And there's no set time limit or time elapse between announcement and making it happen, is there? No. No. So for just to illustrate it for the viewers, have a look at the CBA's terms and conditions that John highlights here. So the first one I'll start with is, is Commonwealth Bank. So, so these are the terms, you know, uh, section 17B, uh, of their cash deposit account, uh, the terms and conditions talk about variation of terms and conditions. Um, they say we may from time to time change any of these terms and conditions to adopt or implement any legal requirement, decision, recommendation, regulatory guidance or standard of any court, tribunal, ombudsman service or regulator. So I think for the Commonwealth Bank was when they say regulatory guidance, from a regulator, well, that is not law. So that you don't need par you don't you don't need Parliament to pass a new law to, to to make deposit accounts on the table. You just need a guidance note from APRA to say put these terms they put these conversion right provisions in your um, cash deposit account, and therefore, um, you know, and, and, and because of that, under the CBA contract, they can just do that and they are compliant with their terms and conditions that the depositor agreed to upon establishing the account with the CBA. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll discuss how we can protect ourselves from this. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing the new evidence of bail-in that's been unearthed by John Adams and Martin North. So Craig, this is quite stunning. If you think about bank accounts, most put bail-in aside for a minute. That's actually yep. shocking that that clause is in. And it is in, they, I showed the, um, yep. their, their segment of the, the CBA one. Mm -hmm. if you, people, I really urge people to go watch that show, right? The, the, it's on the Walk the World channel of, of YouTube. Go and watch it and see for yourself. They show it for all the, all the major banks. They're, every bank has a clause in their terms and conditions that say we can change this any time without notice for any reason. Yep. And the regulator guidance p question that uh, is on the CBA's one there, that, is, that entirely fits with how bail-in would work, where, the, where APRA says to the banks, um, well, the banks are in trouble, APRA says, change your terms and conditions so that we can bail in your deposits, yep. right? There's no protection for Australians. Look, Robbie, APRA is a, is a creation of the Prudential Regulatory Authority in England, right? It's a creature that's designed not to protect us, but to protect the banks. In 2013, right. after Cyprus, where they did try and bring in bail-in, it caused us to go on a massive mobilisation down here. Why? It's because this was to be the policy for the entire world. In fact, it is the policy for the entire world coming out of the Financial Stability Board, you know, which is based at the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland. But our mobilisation is the reason they have had to do it sneakily here. Yeah, they, well... They look, couldn't do it openly because we made it so They did it open hot. in New Zealand, they've done it openly in Canada. No one protested in Canada because no, Canada, no one knows about it in Canada, That's right? right? And they couldn't do it. Now, we came up with the fact that they intended to bring this legislation in, right? And we protested it, we campaigned on it, we put large-scale advertisements in the newspaper because this is consistent with the global financial oligarchy's intention to steal people's deposits to protect themselves. So what was, what's happened now is that back in February, we campaigned to try and actually have a... a clause put into the legislation that the APRA was wanting at that particular time to say deposits would be excluded. And you saw this a phenomenal event whereby eight senators were in the Senate and they, this legislation was just waved through. And they knew if One Nation senators would have moved that amendment to do that and they pushed it through while and they were in the chamber. This would have undone everything that's yeah. happened in terms of this legislation uh, taking on bail -in. It would have mean that any of these terms and conditions in the bank's own conditions would have been illegal. Yes. Now, and that's that's the really interesting thing. Well, so um, Martin North says later in this show, he says, look, the government, to clarify this, all the government has to do is amendment to exclude, amend it to exclude deposits as was initially intended by One Nation back in um, February. So I don't think they're going to do that, Craig. The other way to, to make sure it doesn't happen, though, is quite simple. There's already a bill in Parliament to do yeah. it. It's, it's the Glass-Steagall bill, our Glass-Steagall bill, the Banking System Reform Separation of Banks Bill 2018. The, very, the biggest section of that bill yep. reigns in APRA, brings it under tight parliamentary control, and section four, four, part 13 of section 14 says, APRA shall not consult with, nor accept, nor implement the recommendations or decisions of any foreign bank or foreign authority, including, but not limited to, the Bank of England and the Bank for International Settlements, without the prior express written approval and consent of the committee, meaning the parliamentary committee. In other words, APRA is not, will not have the authority to go ahead and order a bail-in yep. like it currently has yes. um, under this legislation, right? So, look, there's no, there's no personal way to protect your deposits. There's a political way. Fight for this bill. This is why write to your Member of Parliament, email them, call them up, write to uh, uh, the Royal Commission, send this Martin North John Madden's video to your Member of Parliament, demand they watch yeah, it. Yeah, wake them up. Wake them up, exactly. Call in and get a copy of the Australian Alert Service for more information. Yeah. Craig, thanks for joining us yeah, today. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks for joining us, viewers. See you next week.